back for worship a second time on the Lord's Day. So let's stand together and hear God call us to worship from Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Loved ones, God greets you this afternoon, saying grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's sing a setting of Psalm 124 uh, in our Psalter hymnal, Now Israel May Say. Amen. Let's pray now that the Lord would, uh, by His Spirit, illumine our understanding of His Word today. Let's pray. Oh, our gracious God, thank You for Your Word that we have. Thank You for authoring it through Your servants. Thank You for preserving it through the ages. Thank You that we can read it, we can sing it, we can pray it, we can hear it preached to us. And so now, God, we pray that by your Spirit, you'd open our hearts, our minds, our understanding, strengthen our faith through the reading of it, the hearing of it, the preaching of it, the singing of it. And so may our faith be strengthened and you be glorified. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our Old Testament lesson uh, that's printed for you in the bulletin is from Psalm 53. So let's give ear to the Word of God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. 
There is none who does good, not even one. Have those who work evil no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon God? There they are in great terror, where there is no terror. For God scatters the bones of him who encamps against you. You put them to shame, for God has rejected them. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When God restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. And our New Testament lesson comes from Romans 3, verses 9 through 26, and 1 John 4, 7 through 12. What then, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And our second New Testament text is 1 John 4, verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world, so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. So far, the reading of God's Word. You may be seated. So, our confessional reading comes again from the Canons of Dort, and uh, just a brief uh, explanation here before we read the Canons. Uh, as you know, the, our last uh, several weeks, we, we spent five weeks kind of doing a flyby through the canons of Dort, just one sermon uh, per uh, head of doctrine, essentially. Uh, and so I thought that it would be uh, good then to go back with a finer tooth comb and spend some more time in the canons, especially since uh, it, we don't hear preaching through the canons all that often. So, uh, so we'll, we'll just go through again uh, in a little more detail. Uh, so let's uh, give ear to our confessional reading from the first main point of doctrine, Articles 1 and 2. And again, I remind you, this is not the Word of God, but it is nonetheless a faithful summary of it. So Article 1, God's right to condemn all people. Since all people have sinned in Adam and have come under the sentence of the curse and eternal death, God would have done no one an injustice if it had been his will to leave the entire human race in sin and under the curse, and to condemn them on account of their sin. As the apostle says, the whole world is liable to the condemnation of God. All have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. 
And Article 2, the manifestation of God's love. But this is how God showed his love. He sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So may the Lord help us today uh, through his word. So let me ask you several questions, congregation. Who does what in salvation? Does man have any part to play in the saving of his soul? Or does God do everything for the salvation of our souls? Did God choose us for salvation, or did we choose him or some combination of the two? Does God choose who goes to hell if he chooses who goes to heaven? Did Jesus die to save every single human person in the world, or did he specifically die only for those whom the Father gave to him? Are human beings sinful because they sin, or do they sin because they're sinful? Is mankind affected by sin in every part of his soul, or is there something, even if just a little bit of something good, left in him after the fall? Can God's elect reject the grace of God, or is that impossible? Can true believers be deserted by God and fall away because of their sin? It's a lot of questions, isn't it? Well, all of these questions are important for Christians to ask and seek answers to from Holy Scripture. All of these answers to these questions not only affect what we believe about God, ourselves, and our salvation in Christ, but they also affect how we live our lives as well. In other words, it's good for us to be refreshed in the grace and knowledge of our salvation in Jesus Christ so that we might rightly know our God and rightly live for His glory with thankful hearts. And so it's good for us to learn and to relearn how we are saved and who did what to save us so that we might know our God better and learn to thank Him more and more in our Christian pilgrim lives. And so this afternoon, we begin again a series that we would normally call the doctrines or teachings of grace. And so uh, we uh, remember the definition of grace, right? So children, if you are listening, I see my children in the very back. I'm talking to you. Okay, good. I see my son's head popping up there. Um, so listen up. You guys know what grace means, right? Do you guys remember what, what the definition of grace is? Uh, well, in case you forgot, grace means getting something that you don't deserve, right? That you don't deserve. And uh, so, uh, when we speak of the doctrines of grace or the teachings of grace, we're talking about the teachings about getting something from God that we don't deserve. And now, what, it is it, what is it that we get from God that we don't deserve, right? And the answer is salvation. We get salvation that we don't deserve. God, in His grace, gives us salvation even though we don't deserve it because of our sin. And so, the doctrines of grace that we find in Scripture teach us that God has done all the work to save us from our sins and to save us from hell. So, Scripture teaches us that God is the one who saves us, and that He does so entirely from start to finish. It's His work. And so, He is absolutely sovereign in our salvation, and He gives salvation to only to those whom He has chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world. So, those whom He has chosen don't deserve it. Nonetheless, they have it, all by God's great grace given to them in Jesus Christ. Now, you may recall that there are five heads or chapters or main points of doctrine to the canons adored, and each chapter contains a series of articles explaining each doctrine, and also uh, it contains a series of paragraphs rejecting certain errors of teaching about each doctrine. And so today, we uh, begin afresh this series on the doctrines of grace, and we start with uh, the teaching from Scripture known as divine election and reprobation, some of which we heard already this morning, uh, otherwise commonly known as God's unconditional election. 
And so this is the first head of doctrine, the first main point of, of doctrine in the canons of Dort, and Lord willing, we'll spend several weeks uh, learning about this great teaching of God's grace to us in Christ. And so, however, this afternoon, we'll only cover Articles 1 and 2, the first head of doctrine. And we'll be briefly looking at Romans chapter 3 uh, and 1 John 4 uh, to begin teaching us about God's unconditional election of sinners unto salvation in Jesus Christ. Uh, and so we'll learn that God would have been completely just in leaving the entire human race perish under His wrath after the fall, and that in His grace and love, He sent His Son into the world so that whoever believes in Him wouldn't perish. And so we want to learn about these things through these three points this afternoon. First, we'll give another brief history of the canons of Dort. And second, we'll learn the ugly truth about ourselves from Romans 3. And thirdly, we'll learn about the good news of Jesus Christ from 1 John 4. And you'll notice that these Scripture verses come right out of the canons as well. And so first off, let's briefly review again the history of the canons of Dort uh, before we dive into our doctrine this afternoon. You remember that in the early 1600s, Jacob Arminius was a theology professor at the University of Leiden, and he began teaching things concerning man's salvation that were causing a great disturbance among the Reformed churches on the European continent and in the Netherlands acutely. And in 1609, Arminius died, and during the following year in 1610, his followers published what was called a remonstrance or a protest against the theology of the Reformed churches uh, concerning man's salvation. And this remonstrance contained five articles or five points, and these five points are what later came to be known as the doctrines of Arminianism not to be confused with the country of Armenia or the Armenians. And so these are the five points in summary form. They were as follows. First, that God elects to salvation those whom he foresaw ahead of time who would believe in the gospel. In other words, they taught that God's election is conditional. It's based on foreseen faith, they would teach. Uh, second, the Armenians taught that Christ died for every human being, making salvation only possible. In other words, they taught a universal atonement. And Armenians also taught that man is only partially de depraved. There was some good left in them that they could choose. Uh, and uh, they taught that God's grace can be resisted in salvation. And lastly, the Armenians taught that it was possible for God's elect to fall from grace and to lose their salvation. And so after several years of the Reformed churches being disturbed by these unbiblical teachings, the Synod of Dort was called to order on November 13th in 1618. And they had over 150 meetings. Imagine that. They met over 150 times. Uh, and the last of which was on May 9th, 1619. And so the synod met for six months. Uh, the, the synod had delegates not only from the Netherlands, but also from foreign countries as well. So this ended up being really an international synod. Uh, and during those six months, the brothers drafted a response condemning the five articles of the Arminians. And again, I remind you that it was the Arminians who, who started the debate. Uh, and so, this is what uh, has come to be known uh, as the Canons of Dort, which we have before us in our three forms of unity. And so, they're also known as the five articles against the remonstrance. And so, in these Canons of Dort, the Synod laid out the Reformed teaching against each of the five Arminian points. And so, those five responses were that God's election is unconditional, that Christ died only for God's elect. In other words, Christ's atonement was not universal, but limited only to the elect. Sufficient for the whole world, but efficient only for the elect. And they also teach that man is totally depraved. 
In other words, the guilt and pollution of sin has infected every part of man. And that God's grace cannot be resisted. In other words, God's grace is irresistible. And so that God, also they taught that God will preserve His elect all the way to heaven. And they will not fall away from His grace. And so the five doctrines of grace found in the canons of Dort are unconditional election, limited atonement, total depravity, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Now, in our modern day, we've adjusted the order, typically, of, of, uh, of, of these uh, canons and to fit the acronym TULIP. And so, uh, but the actual order of the canons is ULTIP, not TULIP. Um, so, it's good to know that. Now, there's an important neat, uh, point that needs to be stressed uh, before we go any further, and that's, that's this, that these aren't teachings of mere men. These teachings come right out of God's Word and have been taught since the time of the apostles in the early church. And as we make our way through these doctrines, Lord willing, you'll come to see that they arise from Scripture directly, if you don't already recognize that. And hopefully, you'll also notice that every article we read in the canons is full of Scripture quotes and references. So these are not man-made doctrines. They're God-made doctrines that bring Him all the glory for our salvation. And they humble us, and they instill thankfulness in our hearts along the way. And so may God be pleased to work these things in us as we jump into the teaching of His unconditional election. And in order for us to fully appreciate and understand this amazing doctrine of God's grace, we first have to understand the ugly truth about ourselves. That's our second point this afternoon from Romans 3, verses 9 through 23. And we always start here, because we got to understand our sin before we can truly, truly grasp uh, and apprehend uh, God's grace and goodness to us in Christ. And so, Romans 3, verses 9 and 10 says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, that means everybody, the whole world, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. And so, up to this point in the book of Romans, up to chapter 3 here in the book of Romans, Paul's been teaching that everyone, both Jews and Gentiles alike, are on an equal footing before their holy Creator and God. Every human being is guilty before their holy God. And here in Romans, it's absolutely crystal clear. We're all guilty sinners, period. Exclamation point full stop. We're all guilty sinners. And just in case any of us try to sniff out any wiggle room uh, under the, that conclusion, the apostle says, there is none righteous, no, not one. So we kind of don't like to think like that, do we? Now, if you've been a, a Reformed Christian for some time, you you're more comfortable with understanding and admitting your sinfulness, and so it's, it's kind of comes a little more natural to us, but that's a work of God's grace in us to always recognize that. But, but really, it, it, when you stop to think about it, it, it really is kind of, we don't normally like to think about it. We often talk about so-and-so being a good man or woman, or so-and-so being a good kid, or so-and-so has a heart of gold, Right? But in reality, we're anything but good. We're all unrighteous, down to the very last one of us. And so David in Psalm 53 wrote, God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. How did we get this way? How did we get this way? We constantly need to be reminded of this. Uh, how did we all become corrupt and unrighteous before our holy God? Well, you know the answer. 
You know, you've, you've been well taught on these things over the years. But we're all corrupt, unrighteous sinners because we've all sinned in Adam, our forefather, our federal head, our representative in the Garden of Eden in that covenant of works, right, with God. You remember that God promised Adam that he would have eternal heavenly life if he would just obey his command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But we know that he failed to keep that commandment. And as a result, God cursed Adam and all his descendants after him in Genesis 3. And God cursed mankind with both spiritual and physical death. And now all of us are conceived in and born guilty of Adam's original sin. And the pollution of sin then has infected every part of us, so much so that we're born spiritually dead to the things of God. Uh, and we're born under the curse of physical death as well. And not only are we born with the guilt and pollution of Adam's original sin, we also actually sin ourselves, don't we? Each and every one of us digs that hole of sin deeper and deeper every day by every sin we ourselves commit. Uh, and so we're all guilty. That's why Scripture declares in places like Psalm 51.5 that we're conceived in sin. And that's why Jeremiah says that our hearts are deceitfully wicked. And that's why Ephesians 2 says we're born dead in our sins and trespasses. Scripture speaks very clearly on these things. And our Scripture text tells us as well in Romans 3.23 that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so God requires of His human creatures perfect obedience to His commandments and that they, be, that they be completely righteous in order to be acceptable in His sight. But, this, but that is hopeless for us to attain on our own, isn't it? We've all failed, haven't we? And so we're already conceived and born guilty of original sin, and then we go on to sin every day of our lives after that. We can't save ourselves because we're dead in the water before God right from the start. And so we all deserve God's justice. We all deserve God's wrath. We all deserve hell because we're wicked sinners through and through. So I ask you today, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Are you convinced that you are radically depraved and sinful and completely hopeless before God apart from Christ on your own? Do you believe this? Or do you think, nah, I'm not that bad off. Actually, I think I'm pretty good when, when I think about it. This whole sin and curse thing seems a bit extreme, especially when I compare myself to so-and-so. I mean, they're kind of bad, but look at me. I'm doing so bad to myself here. Come on. Um, so, uh, if you secretly believe that in your heart, well, then as an ordained minister of the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ, I say to you, repent of your sins. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because your soul is in grave danger. So repent of your sins and believe in Jesus Christ as your only hope of salvation because it's only through His shed blood, it's only through His righteous life, it's only through His resurrection that anyone is saved. And apart from Him, we're lost and doomed. And so, loved ones, in order for us to understand even just a sliver of God's grace and love for us in Christ, we must be convinced that we're entirely hopelessly lost in our sin apart from Christ. We must understand this ugly truth about ourselves, that we're lost in sin on our own under God's curse, and that we deserve eternal death under the justice and wrath of Almighty God. We must be convinced, in other words, of our total depravity before we can truly understand the grace of God in the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, at this point, some of you may be thinking, mm, Pastor, I don't mean to be technical at all here, but I thought we were supposed to be learning about unconditional election here from the canons of Dort, not total depravity. I mean, I'm just saying, right? 
You know, maybe somebody is thinking that. Well, we might read Article 1 of the first head of the doctrine, head of doctrine in the canons concerning unconditional election, and wonder why it's starting out with sin, the curse of death, and hell. Isn't that topic supposed to be covered in the third chapter of the canons of Dort? About total depravity? What's going on here? Why is it starting with that? Well, if you're wondering about that, let's think it through for a moment. The first point of Arminianism taught that God elected people based on Him looking down the corridors of time before the creation of the world and electing those whom He saw ahead of time would choose to believe in Him. That's what they taught. And it seems to me that one of the roots of thinking in an Arminian is that if God elected people completely apart from anything within themselves, so an Arminian would think, and only on the basis of his sovereign choice, that would make God unfair and unjust. But that, that's not fair. We choose, not God. Even after the fall, there's some good remaining within us that gives us the ability to choose God, and on that basis, God elects us. Surely that's what the case is, how Arminians tend to think. And so our canons of Dort start out talking about unconditional election by saying, okay, Mr. or Mrs. Arminian, you want to talk about God's fairness and justice? If God's justice is what you want, then God would have been completely just by leaving every single one of us to perish in our sins and receive the just wages of our sins, which is death in hell forever. You see, as Article 1 says, because we've all sinned in Adam, lie under the curse, and are deserving of eternal death, God would have done no injustice by leaving them all to perish and delivering them over to condemnation on account of sin. According to the word of the Apostle, and then it goes on to quote Romans 3, 19, verse 23, and also Romans 6, 23. So this is where we must start when we begin considering this great doctrine of God's unconditional election. It was all by His grace and love that He chose anyone to be saved in Jesus Christ in the first place because we're all guilty through and through. We're all born dead in our sins, we can't choose God on our own. In order for anyone to be saved from God's justice and wrath, he had to choose who'd be saved in his Son, Jesus Christ. He would have been perfectly just to leave every one of us under his condemnation. But the good news is that God poured out his justice on Christ instead of us instead of on those whom he has elected in Christ since before the world began. So God, in his grace and love, decided to make a way for sinners to be saved by electing them unconditionally before the foundation of the world in his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll be learning more and more about this as we make our way through the rest of this series on the doctrines of grace. And so the ugly truth about ourselves is that we're unworthy sinners, dead, deserving of nothing but condemnation and hell under God's wrath and justice eternally. But God in His grace chose some of the human race for salvation in His Son, and He manifested His love toward them by sending His only Son into the world. And that brings us to our third point this afternoon, the good news of Jesus Christ. As 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10 says, In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. So we all deserve justice, but we who have believed in Jesus Christ, that is evidence and proof that we've been elected from the foundation of the world uh, and uh, are recipients of God's love instead of His justice. 
God has loved his elect with an everlasting love in Christ before time. God has loved you with an everlasting love before time. And he manifested that love toward us in time and history by sending his only begotten son, his dearly loved son, into the world to accomplish his purpose of election, which is our salvation. We deserve his justice, but we've received nothing but his love for us in Christ instead. He was incarnate. In our human flesh, he came, but without our sin. And he suffered all the days of his life and obeyed God's commandments in our place flawlessly, perfectly, in all the ways in which we ourselves have failed. And, and then he suffered especially at the end of his life on the cross for our sins. He is the propitiation for our sins. His shed blood and offered up body on the cross has turned away God's wrath from us. He's propitiated our sins. He died a cursed death in our place, forsaken of the Father. He received the justice that we deserved. And thankfully, he rose from the dead. And that is the proof that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice, his propitiation in our place setting us free from our sins, giving us new life, eternal life even. And so God loved us by sending His Son to do all of that so that we might live through Him, even though we deserve death. Yes, we still physically die, but our death is not a payment of sins, right? As our catechism reminds us, it's an entrance into eternal life for us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We go right into the presence of the Lord forever, the joy of heaven. And so you see, as 1 John plainly tells us, we have the forgiveness of our sins and life in Christ, not because we love God, but because He loved us first and sent His Son to turn away His wrath against our sins. So you see, it's all about what God has done for us. That's why it's called unconditional election. There's nothing that we contribute. Well, technically, we contribute sin. That's it. All the other conditions are met by Christ. And then even the gift of faith is not ours, through which we receive the benefits. It's a gift of God. And so it's all about what God has done for us, not the other way around. So in conclusion, loved ones, when you think about the ugly truth about ourselves, but the wonderful good news of Jesus Christ, far from making us lazy in our, in our sins and life, it makes us worship the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit, our triune God, with thankful hearts, doesn't it? He's given us what we don't deserve, the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. And it also instills humility in us because we know there's nothing righteous in us in and of ourselves. So how dare we look at others and think, wow, we're so much better. We know ourselves to be miserable sinners. And so far from making us prideful, this doctrine ought really make us humble, and it does. Uh, and so, and, and lastly, it produces gratitude in us, doesn't it? I mean, when you truly understand these things and begin to really think them through and digest them and accept them and seek to live in them, and it, it really produces gratitude. Because now we're not working to earn something from God. We're simply working to show our thankfulness to God. That's the fruit, right? It's the fruit of our justification. It's the fruit of our election. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Thankfulness. And so may God be praised, loved ones, as we continue to make our way through the, our understanding of the doctrines of grace from the Word of God. May He be brought all the glory. May we be built up in the faith. And may we uh, worship our Lord, our Lord God, more and more. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your sovereign majesty. Thank You for Your sovereign grace. Thank You for Your everlasting love. Thank You 
God, for sending your Son into the world to save us from our sins. And we thank you that you have chosen a people for yourself before the foundation of the world and given them to Jesus to die for and to rise again for. Thank you for this good news. Lord, we don't deserve any of it. And so may you be praised, may you be brought glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand and, and sing with thankful hearts. We'll sing. Uh, uh, so not only are we continuing to make our way through the Psalms in order, but we're also making our way through Psalm 119 as well. And so we'll stand and sing Psalm 119, setting E. So 119E, teach me, O Lord, your way of truth. loved ones, everlastingly loved ones, God sends you out with this blessing saying to you, grace be with you. Amen.